thank you for coming this evening. No, today's talk. 15 minutes, I'm going to talk about pointers for parents, and then we're going to do a role play. 15 minutes with my middle daughter, Ariana. She'll be joining us in a bit. Um, I'd like to just hop in with answering this question. Do I have to talk to my parents? Now, I'm sure there are many different opinions about that out there. If you're a young adult, whether you're neurotypical or neurodiverse, you know, you're probably going to say, look, my job when I'm 17 or 20 or 25 is to figure out how I can do my life without my parents, right? I want to be as independent as possible. I want to go to school or vocational school or take a year off or get a job. I don't want them telling me what to do. I listen to them for 18 years. It's time for me to figure out how to live my life by myself. And there's some valid thinking that goes with that too. But if I were to answer the question, I would say unequivocally, yes, you need to be able to talk to your parents. And let me tell you why. It's difficult enough, even if your brain is working in your favor to make the transition to young adulthood, because there's a lot of new stressors, there's a lot to learn, there's a lot of skills that you need to get under your belt, and your parents are a really good source of this, because um, even though they might be irritating at times, they've learned a few things in their years on the planet that they could share with you. But in particular, if you have ADHD, and I'm going to talk about ADHD and executive dysfunction sort of in the same sentence, the same phrase. They're not exactly the same, but they're enough cousins, and we'll get there in a minute, that it's it, we can put them together. But if you're somebody who's neuroatypical, whether it's ADHD, you have depression, anxiety, social anxiety, Asperger's, anything like that, your brain, particularly this part of your brain, is not working to help you get into the next phase. This is a prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is a seat of executive functions, and executive functions lie at the root of ADHD. Executive dysfunction lies at the root of ADHD. So if you're trying to go into young adulthood, and for example, you want to go to college in a, you know, a state institution somewhere, uh, away from home, and you're going to be leaving behind your parents, who are the ones who sort of encouraged you to go to college and helped you get through high school and structured your days, and you have very structured days in a high school, and now you're in a college in a new city with people that you don't know, you got a little social anxiety, you're not really able to organize yourself well yet because you're ADHD, and like my oldest daughter, you get to college and you say, you know what, I don't need that riddle anymore. I'm just going to stop using it because I guess it doesn't really make any difference. And accommodations, who needs accommodations? And what's a disability office anyway? Why should I bother with that? I'm here to have a good time. So you're busy socializing and you're not organizing yourself around your work and you find yourself falling apart and things get difficult. It's at a time like that that you need to be able to turn to your parents and say, I need some help. Things are falling apart here. Tell me what I can do. Okay? So the challenge of being a young adult who's neuroatypical is this. You want to be independent, just like your peers who have, you know, sort of, if you will, normal prefrontal cortices. You want to be like them and, and do all the things that young adults want to do or older teens want to do. But at the same time, this guy is four to six years behind your peers, and he's not ready or she's not ready to take on all the tasks of young adulthood. That is when you're really going to need your parents. And you might say, well, why my parents? Because I can turn to the counselor and my friends. My friends will help me get through this stuff. Well, let me tell you something. Your friends might love you dearly, and your therapist might really want to help you, and your school counselor might be your, a great advocate for you, but there's nobody who's going to stick with you through the hard times and the good times the way your parents do. And really, putting it pretty, pretty practically, your parents, in a sense, control the bank. They got the money. And until you're living independently, financially, they're going to have a big role in making your decisions with you in your life. No matter how autonomous you want to be when you're a young adult, they're still going to play an active role in your decision making. So now is the time to get to know your parents as a young adult. Now, that might sound kind of silly, but let me explain what I mean. Your parents up to this point, up to the late teens and early adulthood, have been accustomed to parenting a child. You're not a child anymore. You're a young adult. You're a different animal. You want to be getting out on your own. Their job is to worry about you, to worry enough to hold on and structure your life in a way that you can be safe and you can get the skills that you need and to let go at the same time. That's a heck of a juggling act for everybody. The only way that process works is if there's good conversation among all the parties. So between the young adult and mom and dad, or if it's a single gender household, mom, mom, and dad, dad, 
Good communications is what's critical in all of this. Okay, so now is the time to cultivate the relationship with your parents. Okay, now the problem or the challenge with that, with that is family dynamics are complex at best, right? Your parents carry all kinds of baggage into their relationship with each other and with you and with all the other kids in the family. You bring all kind of baggage into that. How do we all get through our baggage so we can really hear each other clearly and come to some good agreements, which are really helpful for us? And as I, you know, this, this, the talk title says, not hurtful. Okay, How can we come to agreements which move me ahead as a young adult into my life so I can be successful? And they want me to be successful too. All right, step one in terms of conversations with your parents. Get to know your family. Always know your audience if you're doing a presentation, right? I know a little bit about you guys. I know you're probably young adults and older teens. You have ADHD. I probably have some good guesses about the kind of things that you struggled with because I've been working with you guys both as a parent and as a, as a psychiatrist for many, many years now. I know my audience. I know what I need to say to get my point across to people. Now, you might say, that you know, I know my family, I've been living with them for 17 or 20 years, but the fact of the matter is you probably haven't taken the time to think about, okay, how do I actually converse with this family? Because are they open to conversations or are they sort of emotionally siloed? There's going to be two different kinds of conversations. Siloed, we mean everybody in the family sort of has their own little emotional box and you don't really talk to each other about what's going on on the inside. All right. Is my family non-judgmental? They're going to be open arms to whatever I say, or do they tend to be critical, right? Yeah, you have ADHD, nice excuse. Why don't you just get up and do it? It's what I call Nike parenting, right? Just get up and do it. I did it when I was raised. Your brother's doing it. I don't understand why you can't do it. That's a different kind of conversation than somebody who says, hey, I understand what's going on with your ADHD. Let's talk. All right. Do you have a calm family or an escalating family? Escalating families are tough because... You start the conversation and within a few minutes, everybody's stirred up. You're stomping off to your room and slamming the door. Your parents are screaming after you and then they ground you because they're sick of your stuff. Okay. Do they know about ADHD or not? Now things are changing. Parents know more about ADHD now than they used to. There's an incredible number of resources and we're more open to understanding what ADHD and executive dysfunction is all about. But I run into a lot of parents who don't get it. I don't understand what my kid's ADHD is about. Well... We kind of suspect, I'm not making fun of parents, but you know, uh, we kind of suspected that he might have had ADHD when he was little, but we just didn't bother doing anything about it. We figured he'd kind of grow out of it eventually. And there you are getting D's in high school and feeling bad about yourself, right? So do our parents know, are they ready to let go or are they hanging on tight? Now, part of why parents hang on tight might have to do with who you are as a communicator. We'll come back to this in a little bit. What do I mean? Part of what happens with ADHD is we get kind of embarrassed about who we are. And we don't want to disappoint people, particularly our parents. And if this is the 500th time that we've had to say to them, uh, no, I didn't get that assignment done, uh, we don't want to say it. So we say, uh, yeah, I got that assignment done. Or, yeah, don't worry about the test. I did great on the test. Or, oh, I've been going to class all this time. You don't have anything to worry about. Well, your parents find out about this stuff because they're not quite as dumb as they look, right? And they figure out that you're somebody who's kind of lying about stuff a lot and they don't trust you. And their job is to be able to get you to where you are safe and can take on the challenges of young adulthood. And they're looking at you and they're saying, this kid has no clue about how to get to be a young adult. We're going to hold on as tight as possible till we skill them up because we're scared for what might happen if we don't. Also, families differ in terms of emotional intelligence. You know, are they are they uh, really conversant with feelings and they talk about feelings or do they struggle with things? A few other pointers. Pick a good time. Your parents are busy. Make sure you have some private time with them to talk. Pick the parents you want to talk to. Mom, dad, or again, you know, mom and dad, or if you're in a single gender household, which mom, which dad. Pick a few ideas to start with. We are slow to learn as parents. You are complex, wonderful beings. Give us one thing to think about at a time, okay? You might think we're ready to hear it all, but we're not. It takes us a while to adjust. So pick one topic that you want to tackle at a time with us, okay? Small manageable doses. Plan what you want to say, what outcomes you want, and also plan specifically what you want to say. All right, here's some be prepared because conversations never quite turn out, mm, often don't turn out the way we expect them to. Sometimes that's good, sometimes not so good. You're going to have to have multiple conversations. 
grooming your parents for your young adulthood will happen over many years and many different conversations. You're not going to come and say one thing, but a bing, but a boom, it's done. They're ready to move on. Give it time. Um, you might not get the response that you want. Even though your parents love you and they want you to get better, they might not get it the first time. So be ready to come back to the table multiple times to get said what you need said and have them listen. Be ready to deal with escalation. We'll come back to that. And let me make a point about that, you, this next one. You have to balance responsibility and independence. Independence does not mean I'm 21, I can do whatever I want, and I don't have to worry about any consequences at all. What it means is I'm 21, and I got a lot of stuff that I better pay attention to because if I don't get it right, the consequences from the world are going to be way worse than what my parents would deliver on me. So with being free, comes a lot of responsibility to manage your money, have good relationships with people, show up on your job on time, complete your, you know, your schoolwork, um, those sorts of things. Okay, know your own ADHD and how it impacts you. Again, your parents might get this or not. These are just some a quick and dirty on ADHD. It has to do with my prefrontal cortex. This is in charge of executive functions. That's where ADHD happens in my brain. It's four to six years slower than my peers. So it's hard for me to, and everybody should recognize these things, get started, stay motivated, stay focused, not be impulsive and distracted, control my emotions. It creates problems for me academically, socially, at work, at home. ADHD is not just about I can't focus on my schoolwork. It's about a condition that affects all of my life. Okay. Sometimes I feel angry, frustrated, a loser, depressed, like giving up. These are the things that your parents may or may not get about your ADHD. They might not understand how deeply it sits inside your being. So part of what you need to do is say to them, look, if you haven't heard it before, this is critical for you to know about as I'm growing up, okay, into this next phase. You have to think about how my ADHD is going to affect me as a young adult. Okay, tell them what you do with your ADHD. Some good things, some bad things. I try really hard. Sometimes I avoid stuff. I take my meds. Sometimes I drink and smoke weed because that feels good too. I hang out with the people who get me. I might lie to you. I might fight with you. I'm going to do things that I like to do whether or not you like it because they make me feel good. And you know what? This ADHD stuff is for the birds. Maybe it has some qualities that are good. I have ADHD, if you couldn't tell. There's things that I love about being somebody with ADHD. And there's ways that it makes me and other people kind of crazy too. So... I need to do things in my life that are enjoyable for me. So I'm not dealing with this kind of crazy brain all the time making me nuts. Okay. You're going to talk to your parents. Parents are heavily emotionally invested in you. They love you desperately. They want you to be safe. They want you to have happy lives. Whatever that means, they just want you to do what makes you happy. So when you say something to them, they are not going to come in completely objectively. They will come in with all of their fears and all of their reactions. And you're going to react and they'll react. And then you got a mess. And you might have to be the adult in the situation, which means you have to calm things down. So you're going to have to learn how to take a deep breath and another till you feel calm on the inside. You might have to walk away from the conversation. You might have to use fidgets to get this part of your brain working. Why? Because when this guy's working, you can be rational. And then the lizard brain's not taking over and driving all the emotion. Okay. Maybe you get up and move around a lot, right? You have to get your energy out and that gets you focused. And it also calms you down. And you might say something to them like, look, I know the family yells a lot, but this talk is really important to me. Please, can we just try and make a little bit calmer? You might have to make a direct plea. Ask people to be quiet. Maybe you say, we need to stop this because it's not working right now. Can we come back later when everybody's calmed down? You can also ask them, for right now, can you just listen to what I have to say? Maybe at some later date, we can listen to your viewpoint because I realize I need to do that. But I just want to be heard right now. For the next 15 minutes, just listen to me. That's a legitimate request in a conversation. And be ready to ask for ask outside help. Families are tough animals to crack. Sometimes you might need people to come in. Dealing with lying, avoiding, so on and so forth. This is a bugaboo, okay? It's a trust buster. If your parents think you lie, they will not trust you. You have to put it on the table. A lot of people with ADG end up lying, fibbing, covering up, whatever. Be honest about it. Tell your parents that you want to try and change it. 
tell them that you understand that it breaks trust. Ask their advice for how they think it might get better. Make them your allies in problem solving this. Ask them if you trust in me, would it be easier to let me do what I want you, what I want to do? That sort of frames everything that you're saying to them around trust. Trust, and again, remember with freedom comes responsibility. Okay, you are also going to ask for help. Um, you sometimes, particularly if you're brought up as a guy, guys think I have to do it all myself. You know, I'm a cowboy out on the plains and I got my horse and my, my hat and my gun and it's all up to me and no, I can't show anybody if I'm weak or if I need anything or if I'm hurting, I got to just make it happen. Well, that doesn't work even if you don't have a neuroatypical brain and if you do, it's even a lot tougher. So you need to be ready to get help. Read about things, prepare, you know, to talk to your parents about the Ch choices there are for help like medication, EF coaching, talk therapy. Remember that your parents want to get you better, help you get better, but they might not need know how to, so they need you to guide them. Again, explain how the ADHD impacts you. Tell them, I have tried to handle this myself for a long time and it's not working. I can't do it. I need some guidance and I need some support. And ask them if they'd be open for you to speaking to some professionals, you know, med manager or a therapist or an executive function coach who could help you deal with your ADHD better. Again, these are all sort of simple ideas to put out on the table, but the key thing is to be able to work with your parents over time and kind of persuade them so they begin to see your point of view while you are also trying to hear their point of view. Okay. Exploring the college transition, I'll go through this really quickly. This is a whole balance between how autonomous am I versus how much do I depend on, on my parents. I want you to be thinking as you move on into young adulthood, you have to think about what you want to do. If your parents say college, you might say gap year. You have to figure out how to have a conversation with that. Begin thinking about the choices, gap year, vocational school, get a job, uh, go to four-year college, go to community college. Talk to people, read up on it, figure out what you want to do with that. Talk to your parents. I'd like to talk with you about exploring a few different options. Again, many conversations. Be realistic about your challenges. If you have ADHD and you're socially anxious and you're depressed and you're smoking weed and you've never learned your study skills and you're very disorganized and you don't want to use your accommodations and you're not using your medications, if you think going away to a four-year college in another state is going to work, it won't. Be realistic about what you can do. Maybe in four years from now, once you've got your foundational skills in place, you can go to a four-year college, but it might not be the time. So be realistic with yourself about what your prefrontal cortex is saying to you, because it's going to tell you loud and clear what you're capable of. And this part is going to grow. But it's going to take time. It takes about 10 years into once you're, you know, graduate from high school. Probably in your late 20s is when this part finally grows in and you find it easier to, to consolidate those skills that you need to be effective at being an adult. OK. And let your parents know that you're willing to use help, counselors, accommodations, meds. This is my very lovely middle daughter, Ariana. She's not the one with ADHD, but she grew up with two sisters with ADHD. So she has seen it uh, from inside the family for many years. And uh, what we're going to do is a little role play between the two of us. And I, I want you guys who are in the audience to listen for these things in this role play. It's just a conversation between a dad and a daughter who's 17 years old with ADHD named Kelly. Okay. It's going to be a short conversation, but there's a lot of really important points that can get made in a short conversation. Listen for this. She's going to make a very specific request about what she wants. She's going to have to de-escalate that. She's going to have to ask to be heard and not criticized. She'll give voice to her experience with ADHD. She'll also be honest because she wants to be a responsible adult. Admit what her own challenges are and her past mistakes. She's going to create a specific plan for her looking responsible and acting responsible and not just looking responsible. She was, will be willing to plan the natural consequences if she messes up. Okay, this is what adults do. You think about what's going to happen and you say, okay, if this is a consequence, I'm willing to own that. Okay, if I'm going to make the choice, I have to be willing to own the consequence. She's going to use dad as an ally to bring mom into the conversation, not in this conversation, but later on. Okay, 
She's going to offer feedback and appreciation for how the conversation went. That's so important. You're trying to say to your parents, you just did a great job having this wonderful conversation. I would love to do this with you again. Thank you so much. That will warm their hearts and make them come back to the table more openly. And she's going to request a future conversation to keep building trust. A lot's going to happen in a very short time. So let's uh, rock and roll here. Dad, I'd like to talk to you about something. Okay, what's that? Well, I'd like some more freedom to make my own social decisions and go out with my friends when I want and do what I want. Listen, Kelly, we've talked about this before. You are having trouble in school. You're not focusing. You, you, you want to talk to me about hanging out with your friends, but you're almost flunking two classes. Yeah, this conversation is really important to me. Can you listen to my point of view for just a few minutes? I feel like we just started and you're already telling me no. Look, uh, look, I just said we've had this conversation before a lot of times. I'm really not clear that talking about it again is going to do anything of value. And do you want me to bring your mom in here? Because if I have some stuff to say, she's really going to have some stuff to say to you. That in this family, we tend to go from talking with each other nicely to a whole lot of screaming. And I really don't want to do that today. Can we both take a deep breath and see if we can have a good conversation with each other, please? All right, fine. I will calm myself down. Thank you for coming and trying to talk to me about this stuff. I do appreciate that. Go ahead and tell me what you want to say, and I'll listen to you. Okay. I know your mom don't trust me because of the things I've told you before, but I'm 17, and even if you don't agree with everything that I might do with my friends, I would really like a little bit more room to make my own decisions. Okay, be specific, please. What are you asking me to agree to in this moment? Okay, I'll start with one request. Okay. So Jason is having a party this weekend, and I'd like to go. Mm-hmm. When's it going to be? Saturday night at his house. And how do I know you're telling me the truth about where you're going and what you're doing? Mm, I guess you don't. Right. Kelly... Can you tell me why you lie to me and mom so much? Dad, I'm going to give you an explanation, and I don't know if you'll believe it, but it's true for me. You know that I have ADHD, and you mostly think about it in terms of me getting good grades. But honestly, for me, it goes way beyond that. I'm always trying to make sure that I don't disappoint you and mom, but honestly, I feel like I do that all the time. And then when I tell you pers personal stuff, you usually scream at me or criticize me instead of listening. It's a lot easier just for me to make something up in the moment so I don't get yelled at, really. And I don't feel like I'm disappointing you and I don't have to feel ashamed again. But I really don't want to keep doing it this way. Well, look, you got a long way to go before you make up for your past mistakes. Dad, I'm trying to change things here. I need your help. I want things to be different so I can grow up a little bit. And I'm guessing that you and mom would probably like to see that too. I know that I can be a real pain in the neck to you guys, and I would like to try to be a little bit more of an adult. All right, look. That sounds good to me. I can't argue with that. Let me ask you something. Is there going to be drinking at this party? Probably. And are you planning on drinking? And be honest, please. That would be yes. Okay, thank you for that. And what am I going to say about that? Uh, you'd probably say that you don't want me to do it because it's illegal, but you understand because you did it at my age, maybe. And mom would probably say she doesn't want me drinking. Okay. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you've listened to me before about this. All right. Look, Kelly. I know you're going to do this because it's part of growing up. I might have done it when I was your age. But the fact is, you're my daughter, and I worry about you. And that's what I'm supposed to do as your dad, because I want to make sure that you're safe. So tell me, how are you going to be safe at this party? Um. Okay, if I drink, I'll have food in my stomach. Uh, I always stay with my girlfriends, so we keep an eye out for each other. I never put my glass down. Uh, I watch how I feel so I don't get drunk and I'm doing stupid stuff. Um, 
if I feel like I might be unsafe, I call you guys right away and I can use you as an excuse if I need to leave. And I definitely don't drink and drive and I don't ride with someone who's drinking. I thank you. I feel better that you have thought about those things. You've kept them in your head. I appreciate that. Um, if we decide, your mom and I decide that it's okay for you to go to the party, when do you expect to be home? Mm. Kelly, we've been through this before. I get it. You want some freedom. Uh, and you need to show me a little bit of responsibility. Um, last time you tried this, you got into some serious trouble because your mom and I called you about 200 times on your cell phone and you never answered. And you came home drunk at 3.30 in the morning. I am not interested in repeating that experience with you. You need to tell me how it's going to be different this go round. Okay. Well. I know that I will get grounded if I do that again, and you'll probably never give me this chance again. And I will ruin an opportunity to build trust with you and mom, which is honestly the worst part. All right. And you're going to be home by when? <sighs> Two. Try again. One. Okay. You got to deal at one o'clock. Um, what if you mess up? What are the consequences going to be? Well, like I said, I really, I really want to be treated more as an adult, and I want to build trust with you guys. So I know that I would, I would get grounded, and I really want to avoid that. All right, it would mean a lot to your mom and me if you could pull this off. Dad, can I talk to you about mom for just a second? Yeah. Why? Well, what's up with that? Well, although it kind of scares me because she and I fight all the time, I do want her to know about this also. Do you think I should talk to her? Uh, look, let me tell you. Um, I'm going to handle this one for you. I'll go to back for you. Um, maybe next time you guys have a face-to-face -face conversation. I don't think she's quite ready, and maybe the two of you are not quite ready to have this conversation. Um, but I'll, I'll do this for you. But... I'm counting on you getting this right, Kelly. Dad, I wouldn't ask you for this if I didn't think I could do it. It feels really important to me. Well, I'll tell you, I feel very proud that you're willing to try and do this and that you have this conversation with me in the first place. So thank you for doing that. Thanks. I appreciate you talking to me and not blowing up. It means a lot to me. And I'd like to be able to come to you and talk about this stuff more in the future. And I know I still have growing up to do. And sometimes I can act like a jerk. But I think you and mom have some things to teach me, and I need to listen a little bit. Thank you. Um, and I'll tell you, it was helpful for me to hear about your ADHD. I'd like to hear more about that because, you know, I don't get that. Um, I don't have ADHD, and I, I don't think I really understood everything that it means to you and how you experience it. So, um Thank you for being honest, and I'm looking forward to talking about this again soon, and I'll talk to your mom, okay? Thanks, Dad. All right. Love you, honey. You are your parents' key concern. Make sure you're making sure that you're safe and healthy is important to them. They're going to show you their fear first, probably, but you need to show them, as we saw in this conversation, you can balance freedom and responsibility. Let them know you've listened to them and you hear them. Be ready to talk about consequences. Remember to remind them about your prefrontal cortex being behind. Practice not escalating. Um, remember, it's hard to change how we communicate. Hard to teach an old dog new tricks. So you got to give it time over many conversations. Again, it's okay to ask your parents just to listen sometimes. No judgments, no problem solving, no anger. And if you feel like you're not being heard, stop the conversation and say it. And also be ready for the reactions you might not want to hear. Um, remember, if they didn't hear it this go round, then they're probably going to hear it the next time. Um, I think in the in the interaction that you and Ari just gave, yes. it seemed to suggest that the parent has the hard time staying calm and keeping their cool when right. this particular mom is saying it's actually quite the opposite it's the mm -hmm. the adhd student or teen who you know is storming out punching the walls throwing a fit so sure. what do you have to say about that how do you suggest keeping a teen calm 
in these type of conversations. So let me, I'll go back into a tiny little bit of science here. So Russell Barkley, who's one of the uh, people who've done a lot of research on executive function, talks about the notion of, um, uh, of emotional dysregulation, that that is a key aspect of ADHD and executive dysfunction. And, and what that means is what we see in our, our young adults who have ADHD, that uh, emotions tend to escalate very, very quickly. And unless they've learned the skill sets to kind of manage it, it's very hard for them to bring it back to a more reasonable level. So yes, about one or two times my daughters also uh, found themselves in that position. Uh, so, um, uh, but I think that um, a couple of things come to mind here. One is um, there has to be a boundary somewhere about to what degree you as a parent are tolerant of the sort of natural challenges that somebody is meeting in terms of regulating themselves and how much that person is hijacking the family dynamic okay because everybody has a right to feel safe and comfortable um, uh, and not threatened by any other family members verbally threatened or physically of course but um, so you have to think about that as a parent where do I put those limits in this family uh, if you are sensing that this is too much it's more than I want to deal with it. It's affecting the kids and it's it's uh, happening all the time and there's an uproar in the house every day. Then I think you need to uh, talk with the, 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 the young adult, the teen, and say, look, you need to get help for this. You know, if there are um, emotional problems that you have that you need to talk about, you can go see a therapist. Um, some therapists work specifically on helping people build skills around emotional regulation. Maybe you need to do some things like exercising more because you got to get that energy out. I know my oldest daughter, Ariana's older sister, if she's not exercising, you don't want to be around her. Too much energy, too much irritability, too much snapping back and forth. And so she knows one of the ways she self-regulates is through exercise. So. You know, basically, you have to start working with your teen or young adult about getting some of these skills. Sometimes, frequently, uh, uh, the, for a lot of the young adults that we work with, um, we will have them be in a DBT program, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. It's a very skill-based program that grows out of cognitive behavioral therapy techniques. And it's specifically for people who are highly emotionally dysregulated. How do they learn how to regulate themselves? The other piece is medication management. You have a brain that's not doing what it needs to do to manage irritability, to manage mood. So I would certainly recommend if you have a kid who's struggling this way that you say, let's get you a good psychiatric evaluation and psychological evaluation and think about if there are medications that you can use that will help heal your brain or stabilize mood and make it easier for you to get by day to day. The thing that's hard to realize as the parent when you're the on the receiving end of all of that is as bad as it feels for you, it feels worse for the kid. Maybe not in that moment because there's that anger and that can feel really good, but nobody likes being emotionally unstable. Nobody likes a psyche that's not predictable. Um, you don't feel good about yourself when you're having those kind of reactions. So. Um, you know, as a parent, easier said than done. I understand that. Um, uh, there were many times when it was hard to be as compassionate as I would like to be when my daughters were struggling. Um, but that's an important thing to keep in mind, that this is a hard road for them as well. And they count on us to at least some percentage of the time be, be the adults. So, and, and, you know, part of why I sort of positioned the dad this way is because <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I don't feel good about saying this, but it wasn't too dissimilar for how, how I interact with my daughters. You know, I could get heated about these things and make those kind of, you know, almost sort of snide remarks and not particularly sympathetic. And it's not necessarily where I'd end up in the conversation, but that was part of my presentation. You know, these these kids are sometimes tough to deal with. Um, and you know it, they know it. Okay, I have another question for you. Um, I have a a participant asked, I was wondering how to explain to parents about how overpunishment is less effective than using consequence with a teachable moment. Yes, that's a good statement. The consequence has to, I think what's being said here is the consequence has to match 
the the um, if you will the crime right uh, the the bad behavior the problem behavior the consequence has to match it you need to have credibility with your child around consequences that means a few things one is if you say I'm going to say it one more time and then there's going to be a consequence mean it because by the time you get to five or six times or wait until your dad comes home they know who's in charge in the family and it's not the parents okay so early on with a kid they need to know and this is not to be cruel or overpowering but they it, they need a sense of structure in order to feel safe you know they got these as little kids they got these little brains that are going all over the place and even as neurotypical teens they're not self-regulating very well so having a structured emotional setting that they grow up in is very important they need to know that you're comfortable setting those kind of limits with them but then yes you're right it has to be appropriate you know you can't say uh, oh you didn't finish your homework i'm taking your phone away for a month what's the link between that i take your phone away what behavior am i shaping okay so the other thing that i think i heard in this comment was look the kid didn't have their phone they didn't get their homework done you sit with them you say this has been happening several times what's going on with you um engage them in the consequences are there things that we ought to be doing with you as your parents that's going to put some fire you know under your seat uh in order to get this right um because this is not going to hedge in a good direction so maybe engage them in setting the consequences but I, th I think ultimately you just need to be reasonable um i'll give an example i won't go through the whole story because it's a, a lengthy and a, <laughs> And a little embarrassing for my children but suffice it to say when my daughter was about 17 you know just sort of fresh into the driving thing the oldest one again um uh, she was stopped by a cop for going you know 30 miles an hour over the speed limit by the local mall here which was ridiculous and uh, my consequence for her was okay for every mile an hour over the speed limit uh you lose your driving privileges for a day so you're not going to be driving anywhere for a month it made sense to her it was the link i'll tell you some hard consequences too now that's the, the oldest the oldest one's like me she's got a big mouth and she doesn't know when to stop talking right so she was in college she had a roommate who was a little not too stable roommate calls the cops on her for absolutely no reason while shauna is out of the house shauna comes home the cops are standing around her apartment shauna says what's going on here right because she's the one who's in charge the cop says stand back we're dealing with this she says it's my apartment you tell me what's going on here the cop took her down to the ground, arrested her, brought her to jail. She calls us. She also called Ariana, her, her, her middle sister, who happened to be at University of Maryland, too. What I said to Shauna was, that's nice. Figure out how you're going to get home. Figure out how you're going to get out of jail. And also figure out how you're going to pay for a lawyer because you know what? You're the one who created the situation. And it's not my responsibility to take the consequence for you. That was a tough lesson. But that was a fit. I didn't rescue her. It wasn't easy to do that you know but it was a fit in terms of how sort of egregious the behavior was and and the and the strength of the message he needed to get from the consequence one more thing about this we deliver inappropriately strong consequence when we're leading with our fear okay because underneath our reaction of anger is I am so angry because I'm so afraid that I can't control you and make you better. And it's frightening me what you're doing. So obviously the best thing I can do is slam you upside the head as much as possible with this consequence because that's gonna change who you are. But it doesn't. And behind all this is also recognizing, again, point of performance. It doesn't matter if you've told them 800 times if they took the test on what is right behavior they get an a plus in the moment what happens they can't look back at what they've done in the past they can't make a good judgment about what's going to happen in the future they can't control their emotional impulses right they can't decide in that moment what the right thing is to do they might not even remember what the right thing to do is in that moment because this isn't working so it's not only important to deliver consequences it's important to deliver the treatment to them that will allow them to get better control over this part of their brains 
So they will internally be able to learn how do I um, how do I manage my own behavior? That's the goal here. How do I manage my own behavior? Oh, now I have some skills to do that. You know, I can put a reminder on a phone about what I'm supposed to do, about when that paper's due, or I can control my emotions when I get overwhelmed, or I can think about the future and plan for my choices. Thank you, Rick. Okay, so I have one mom who's saying, "Could you, could you have just said no?" to the party because you're not ready to allow the drinking? Absolutely. <laughs> the, 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 the presentation that I gave, that Ari and I did, was one that would probably have come after many, many discussions, right? There's a lot of foundation in that. Um, I, I would probably not just say, no, and that's it. I would say, I'm not comfortable with that. I'm going to give you an answer right now that you don't like. I don't want you going to this party. And I would like to talk to you about it because what you're trying to do is be an adult. And I respect that. Okay. And I also know that these things have become available to you as an adult. Sex, driving, drugs are pretty powerful. And if they're used in a way that's not cautious, the consequences can be permanent and even potentially life threatening. I'm not ready to go there with you. Maybe you think I'm nuts and I'm overly cautious. That's okay. I'm your parent. I brought you in the world. I'd like you to stay in the world, okay? Um, so no for this. We'll talk about it. If you want to talk about it now, we can. If you're too angry with me, we can talk about it later. Uh, don't go to your dad behind my back or your mom behind my back and ask them that same question because that will really get you into trouble. Um, but maybe this is something we could work towards, but we need to put some things in place. In this case, one of the things that Ari said, which ad, ad nauseum I reviewed with my children, was exactly that list of what do you do and what don't you do at a party. I will say something else that here that some parents feel comfortable with and other ones are like, oh my God, how can a psychiatrist have said that to their children? But this is what I said when they're about 15. I said, listen, girls, let me tell you something. In the next three years before you get out of this house, there's going to be three things that you do. You're going to get drunk at least once. You're going to smoke weed at least once. And you'll probably have sex at least once. I said, I kind of am guessing that that's the case because guess what? Your mom and I did it too. Okay? And so did a whole bunch of other parents around here. I'm not saying I condone it. I'm not saying I'm excited about it and we're just going to let it go. But I want you to know I'm aware of what it means to be growing up. I know what the risks are. And I want you to hear from me. I want you coming back to me and talking about this stuff. What I'm telling you right now is this is an open conversation. I'm not going to punish you because you're trying to grow up. But I am going to help you grow up in a way that's safe. Because I love you and I want to make sure you're still here. Right? But it takes a long time and every family is different with regard to this. I happen to have girls who would talk to me, I think, most of the time. Although, as Ariana said, she probably lied once or twice. Um, but I had girls who talked to me and we were able to establish trusting relationships, but that's the key. Um, and that has to start early on. Uh, when they're little, you figure out ways that you can build trust with them and say, look, I'm going to give you this responsibility. I'm going to give you some freedom and here's your responsibility. We're going to trade these things off. How can I tell you what is going to happen in the future when my parents cannot predict what they will do in the future? I don't plan to run a stop sign necessarily, but stuff happens. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, <laughs> so, okay, look. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it's true that we can't predict everything about the future, right? But we can be thoughtful about the choices that we make. All right. One of the challenges with executive dysfunction is exactly what you're talking about there on that question. It's hard for my brain to visualize a consequence. It's hard for my brain to visualize a scenario in the future. Think about what I did in the past. Put those things together and say, if I do A, this will happen. If I do B, this will happen. And not only is it hard to visualize that, but you said the key word there, impulsive. In the moment, who knows what's going to happen, right? You know. 
in the moment, it seems like the right thing to do. I love to tell the story about my youngest who called me one day. I was out and she said, I can't talk. I said, what? She said, I can't talk. I said, why can't you talk? She said, because in the moment, it seemed like a really good idea for me to put my tongue on the ice machine in the refrigerator. It's like, okay. So that's where impulsivity can get you, right? So you're right. This is one of the problems. So I'm not saying your parents do everything right. They're going to role model some good behavior, and they're going to role model lousy behavior because they're human beings, and they're still learning too. All you can do is ask yourself and say, look, do I want to be making safe decisions and healthy decisions? You know, do I want to be on this planet a little bit longer so I can enjoy my life? And if I do, I'm going to work really hard to stop and think about. I might want to talk to my friends about the right thing. I might want to do the stop thing. You're thinking about doing something. You kind of get it in your head that maybe it's not the right thing to do, but you don't want to do it anyway. So you just say, okay, look, stop, stop. I'm going to count to 10. And after I'm done counting to 10, I'm going to let this part of my brain kick in. I'm going to come back and revisit this choice. The ADHD brain acts like this, right? The lizard brain has a desire. It wants it done right in that second, and it just overrides the prefrontal cortex, which is the logical part of the brain. You have to learn how you slow yourself down. Say no to the impulse in the moment. Bring this part in and think through the decision. And that takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of self-awareness. So that's a great question. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for allowing me to do this and for Ari as well. Thank you, Ari. And um, I enjoyed it thoroughly. And uh, good. I wish everybody I wish everybody luck. And uh, now that we're kind of post-COVID here, hopefully uh, a really enjoyable summer. So, Thank you, Dr. Silver.